tonight on Reporting Scotland. Scottish Labour's interim leader has expressed his dismay after his private views on the contest to replace Kezia Dugdale were recorded. I'm clearly disappointed and gutted that what I thought was a private conversation was tape recorded. Um, I believe that to be a private conversation um, and the point is that I now need to move on and get on with what I'm doing. Also on the programme, patients who were part of the review group into mesh implants say they were cynically used to make the final report less biased. A study set to examine the impact of land ownership here on the people who live on it. The 11 year old who wrote to the education secretary asking him to help find a teacher for her class. Good evening. Scottish Labour's interim leader says he's gutted that his private views on the contest to replace Kezia Dugdale were recorded. The taped conversation revealed that Alex Rowley, who had said he would remain neutral, is backing the left wing candidate Richard Leonard over Anna Sarwar. The First Minister pounced on claims of Labour plotting and said the party's internal squabbling was selfish and self-indulgent. Here's our political editor, Brian Taylor. The man in the middle, the man who promised to stay neutral in Labour's leadership contest. An emotional Alex Rowley says he carries on as interim leader despite being taped voicing firm support for the left-wing candidate Richard Leonard ahead of Anna Sawa. Firstly, I'm clearly disappointed and gutted that what I thought was a private conversation was tape recorded. Um, I believe that to be a private conversation um, and the point is that I now need to move on and get on with what I'm doing. We have a party that wants to unite, we have a membership that wants us to get on with the job in hand and that's what we all need to do. We need to pull together, have this election and move forward. Enter on stage the key players. And Asawa arrives in company with Kezia Dugdale, whose resignation prompted the contest. Then Jackie Bailey, who accused the left of plotting to oust Ms Dugdale from the leadership. Was it a plot on your behalf, Mr Leonard? One of Richard Leonard's staff members said talk of a plot was piffle, or rather a shorter word, also beginning P-I. Mr Leonard deplores such crude talk, but still summons a smile as he enters the chamber. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Inside, his scheduled question gives the First Minister an opening to attack. That really is the difference between the SNP and Labour. We fight for Scotland. Scottish Labour just fights amongst themselves. <laughs> Ironic cheers from the Labour benches, but there's more. Scottish Labour's behaviour is selfish and self-indulgent, and it proves they're not fit to be an opposition, let alone a government. And what of the two contenders for the leadership? Did you plot uh, against Kezia Dugdale? I absolutely have not plotted against anybody since I was elected to the Scottish Parliament, except plotting against Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP. That's who the Labour Party needs to remove. That's who I mean to remove. I'm not going to get involved in the internal uh, spats. I'm going to focus on my positive ideas for Scotland and returning the Scottish Labour government. But this remarkable row persists, and so do the questions. Did you plot to oust Kez Dugdale from no the leadership? Course. No course. Brian Taylor, reporting Scotland, Holyrood. The Prime Minister has said she's willing to meet the First Minister to try to break the impasse between London and Edinburgh over Brexit. Discussions between the Scottish and UK governments have become bogged down. Scottish ministers have accused their UK counterparts of attempting a power grab over the return of powers from Brussels after Brexit. Our Westminster correspondent David Porter has been speaking to Theresa May in Downing Street. How the Prime Minister delivers Brexit will not only determine her and her party's future, but the prospects for all of us. It's that important. Theresa May is adamant Scots should be upbeat. We expect that a significant number of new powers will come down to Holyrood as a result of the Brexit decision, and we will set those out in due course. Talks with the Scottish Government have become bogged down. Now the Prime Minister seems keen to try and end the logjam. 
we will go forward with Brexit as the United Kingdom. We're talking to the Scottish Government in a whole variety of, uh, variety of ways. And yes, I will be talking to Nicola Sturgeon about how we ensure we get the best deal for the whole of the United Kingdom. So you were willing to sit down with her and say, look, let's try and sort this out. I will be talking to Nicola Sturgeon. That means, yes, the best deal for Scotland, but that we ensure that the interests of people in Scotland are maintained by remaining part of the United Kingdom and part of the internal market of the UK. From the Scottish Government, a qualified welcome. I think that progress can be made. The Scottish Government has entered into all these discussions in good faith, as has the Welsh Government, and we want to make progress. But it is important that the UK Government also have that intention. If we do have, then we're going to make progress. Theresa May and Nicola Sturgeon have met before, but don't share a close working relationship. Officials will now be looking to coordinate diaries. Devolution is now 20 years old and well established, but Brexit doesn't mean the normal political rules have been suspended. Political opponents are still opponents. What people have felt in Scotland is that they have been able to see decisions being taken in Scotland that previously were taken in Westminster. But my challenge to the Scottish Government is I think what the Scottish people are now asking is what about our education? What about our health service? Let's see decisions being made in Holyrood that improve those services, not see them deteriorate. But here, sorting out Brexit still trumps everything else. David Porter reporting Scotland, Downing Street. A school worker who led a six-year-old girl to a store cupboard, stripped her naked and took a photograph of her has been jailed for three years. At Glasgow Sheriff Court, James Moran admitted abducting the girl as she made her way back to a classroom from the toilet at a primary school in Glasgow. The 32-year-old has also been put on the sex offenders register. A movement called Scottish Dawn, an alias of the neo-Nazi group National Action, is to be banned under UK terror law. National Action became the first far-right organisation to be banned in the UK last year. Home Secretary Amber Rudd said she wouldn't allow the vile racist group to masquerade under different names. Being a member of or support, inviting support for the organisation will be a criminal offence, carrying a sentence of up to 10 years. Two patients who were part of the review group into mesh implants have told MSPs that they were cynically used to make the final report less biased. Appearing before a Holyrood committee, they revealed that they were excluded from meetings and they said the health secretary refused their pleas for help. As Lucy Adams reports, dozens of women who'd suffered problems after the procedure joined them at the Scottish Parliament. <laughs> We were cynically used to make the report appear less biased to the public and to those of you here today. We were duped. We are horrified by failure rates of an operation and the severity of injuries that can be life-changing and life-threatening. Patients accusing the health secretary of using them to add credibility to the review of mesh implants and then refusing to remove their names from it. We went to the cabinet secretary for help. What we asked that she delay publication of the report, at least until our concerns were investigated, it was to no avail. The patient representatives are the reason that this review was carried out. They bravely came forward to tell their story, so it's extremely disappointing to hear that they do not think they've been listened to. I've met with them several times and I certainly have heard their concerns and about the harm that they suffered with MESH. The former health secretary questioned the integrity of the UK regulator, the only body able to ban the devices currently. I don't think they're a very professional organisation. I don't think they're a very caring organisation. I don't think they care at all about Scotland. And I, I don't think they've got um, patient care as their number one priority, was my impression. But the MHRA says the lives of millions of people have been improved by them as a regulator and that 90% of their funding for devices comes from government. Oh oh Leslie's just 35 years old, but she has to use a wheelchair to get about. Every day is different, you know, one day I could, you know, manage to get up, you know, with the, the aids um, I've got around the house. Um, other days I'm bed bound, you know, I can't get out of my bed. I'm rubbish sore. The chronic pain is just horrible. The Scottish Government's already announced a review of the review, but today patients said that's a complete waste of time. They say that they were duped 
what they want now is a review of the outcome. Lucy Adams, Reporting Scotland. MSPs have voted unanimously to approve in principle new legislation that will reform the law on domestic abuse. The Scottish Government wants to extend current legislation to cover psychological abuse as well as physical violence. These are Summer's reports. Ghazala Hakim endured years of abuse, both physical and psychological. She's clear though about what left the deepest scars. The abuse affects this day with you because it's so severe and it's so embedded. And it's just so important that for people to realise that the kind of things they say and do, it can have a lasting effect. And how nasty a person can be, where people, they can seem so civilised and charming, but they are very manipulative and monsters within, you know, behind closed doors. You can't do anything. You're hopeless. For more than a decade, the effects of psychological abuse have been on the political agenda. It can go in the bin. Muck. This advert dates back to 2006. Call on Michael Matheson to speak to... Today, the Justice Secretary sought the backing of fellow MSPs to make such abusive behaviour a crime. Examples of what abusers may do to humiliate their partners are horrendous. Forcing someone to eat food off the floor controlling access to the toilet, or repeatedly putting them down or telling them that they are worthless. Support groups say it will create a legal structure to reflect the true nature of abuse. Sometimes there's physical in injury involved in that or, or threats, um, but there's always emotional abuse. And if we don't craft, craft a, an offence, that allows us to prosecute the abuse that women and children are really experiencing, then why will they have any confidence to come forward and say, let me tell you about what's happened to me because I need your help? But some in the legal profession have raised concerns. The bill as it stands does refer to behaviour like intimidating, aggressive, um, controlling behaviour. These are behaviours that can be criminal already. So there may be some confusion in the public's mind as to what exactly this bill is trying to address. With the bill approved in principle at this first stage, the detail will now be scrutinised. It will then be considered further in Parliament before the law can be changed. Lisa Summers reporting Scotland, Holyrood. A study is about to begin into the distribution of land ownership and how it affects communities. It might lead to even more significant changes in land law. Our rural affairs correspondent Kevin Keane has been looking at the issue. Until recently, Findhorn Village on the Murray Coast sat on a vast estate. But when the Laird decided to sell off sections he didn't want, residents used land reform legislation to buy it up. It constitutes land uh, around the village. Now it's in community ownership and so decisions about the future of Findhorn are taken by the people who live there. The right to buy has now allowed people within the village to make decisions on the future. It's given them empowerment. Half a million acres of Scotland is now in community ownership, but some believe that figure is far too small. Scotland's got very, very unusual uh, land ownership patterns with very few people owning vast amounts of land. And that has big societal implications. It concentrates power in people's hands, few people's hands, and it concentrates wealth. Landowners like Jamie Williamson take a different view. He owns and runs the Alvia estate near King Craig in the Highlands with fishing, farming and shooting. But he believes the true power now lies with the urban population, which makes up the bulk of voters. A lot of landowners and farmers and foresters feel that they've been effectively disenfranchised and decisions are being made by the urban population only seeing it as a place for them to recreate rather than from our point of view what we're trying to do is produce the goods and services uh, that we demand. It's been estimated half of Scotland's privately owned land is in the hands of just 432 people. The Scottish Land Commission's study will look beyond that figure at the impact of land ownership on the people who live in our rural areas. Scottish ministers have already said that Parliament will have failed if the concentration of land ownership here isn't diluted. And so there is a political will for change. But experts on land law say making changes won't be easy. 
At the moment, Scotland has a wholly unregulated land market, which means to say that um, it, it, it doesn't really matter where you're from, uh, where your company is based, um, and some people say that's absolutely fine, and that allows for inward investment and this kind of thing, but there are some issues in terms of transparency and accountability. Navigating the arguments will be difficult. The study is expected to conclude next year. Kevin Keane reporting Scotland, Kin Craig. A primary seven pupil at a tiny Highland school has gone straight to the top in a bid to force the authorities to find her class a permanent teacher. Poppy Dennis, one of 26 pupils at Arisaig Primary, wrote to the Education Secretary after she and her classmates were taught by a succession of supply teachers. And already she's got results, as Craig Anderson reports. Who wouldn't want to live here? Well, sufficient numbers of school teachers, apparently. The lack of a permanent teacher at Arisaig Primary has led one 11-year-old pupil to write to Education Secretary John Swinney to complain. Dear Mr Swinney, please can you help me? I am a student slash pupil at Arisaig Primary School. All the teachers are great, but we really need a proper teacher as I'm going into high school soon and I don't know some stuff that I'm meant to. My mum and lots of other parents have been trying to get in, t in contact with those kind of people and they've not been answering, so I decided I could give it a shot and see what I get. Having received Poppy's missive, the Education Secretary at another school today conceded that there is a problem with teacher recruitment. When it crystallises into a problem such as the one that Poppy has raised with me about Arisaig Primary School, we've got to work with Highland Council to try to address that. And I know that Highland Council are advertising that vacancy and are committed to filling that vacancy as soon as they possibly can do. Highland Council said today it had now advertised for a permanent teacher here at Arisaig. So was the letter to the top all Poppy's own work. The letter that she wrote is completely all her own work. Nothing to do with, no input from anyone else at all. So do you think that her efforts are going to succeed when the efforts of parents like yours have failed? I very much hope so. Recruiting teachers is a common problem in many of Scotland's more rural areas. Highland currently has 20 vacant primary school posts. But one wee girl's letter to the man ultimately responsible may have brought the problem into even sharper focus. Craig Anderson reporting Scotland, Arisaig. Final submissions have been heard at Edinburgh Sheriff Court in the inquiry into the deaths of four people in two separate rally car crashes. The Celtic Chief Executive has Bayern Munich in his sights tonight. A free music tuition project for children from some of the most deprived areas of Scotland has been given a glowing report by Education Scotland. Now a reminder of tonight's main news. Ryanair has been threatened with legal action over the way it's dealt with passengers following the cancellation of thousands of flights. And that's all from us for now. I'll be back with the headlines at 8 and the Late Bulletin just after the 10 o'clock news.